in May, um, why parents should have a confidence on the prep that is DOE has made so far. And so that on September 10th, when we send our children to school, we can, oh. we can have them back the same way we send them in the morning. Yeah, look, I go before Adrian because she's too dynamic. So, I, I cannot bear speaking after Adrian. And oh. she's going to give us the most important presentation for our, for our parents and families. So I'm here really just. Senator, you, get, you always get the pause, so you will go ahead. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I, I'm, I'm with Adrian like every night, right, Adrian? <laughs> <laughs> We're Zooming every single night together. Oh. Uh, so I know she's got a lot of things to say, especially as, as uh, Adriana mentioned, you know, things keep changing. And uh, it's, it's not easy for our parents and families to kind of figure out exactly what's going to happen in just exactly two weeks. So it's good that you, you Philip, and the New American Board Association and uh, Dr. Bu and I, I know Roque is on as well, all the members, you guys are putting this together for the parents and families. And uh, to Adriana and Kathy's points, I mean, we're we're involved. Uh, there are lots of families who don't necessarily know about the various meetings and forms that have taken place. So uh, you're definitely reaching a different audience. And I thank you and I congratulate you for that. And with that, uh, it is my privilege to turn it over to the inimitable and, in, and indefe indefatigable Deputy Chancellor Adrian Austin. Thank you so much, Senator Liu. We are together quite quite often <laughs> yeah. uh, these days, and it's because we share um, the passion for making sure that we are engaging with our families and getting information out to our families. And I want to thank you for your work in advocating uh, on behalf of our parents and the important work that you do. And that is why I'm here, uh, is just to be able to answer questions that parents have. I know there are a lot of questions on parents' minds. Um, there's a lot of information. I'm going to pause because I feel like I'm hearing some feedback. So if you're not speaking, can you please put on a mute? All right, we're, we're good. Thank you. Um, so so I just in, in recap, I'm here to make sure that I am sharing information and answering questions. And so uh, I certainly there's a lot of information that's been provided to give more clarity about what to expect in the fall across the last couple of weeks. Today, our chief academic officer, Dr. Chen, gave information about synchronous learning and uh, where we are with our with our agreement with our teachers union on um, how synchronous learning is gonna, gonna look in the fall with respect to remote learning. I'm very excited about that. Uh, and I can certainly provide more details about it, but I also wanna hear the questions that parents have because I can talk at length about all of the different policies from outdoor learning policy to remote devices policy to um, academic policy. But I think it's important to be responsive to the questions that parents actually have. So with that, um, I, I'm gonna sort of step back and, and hear from our communities about where you are, where the anxieties lie and provide as much information as I have to try to answer those questions. So Deputy Sensel, I already have a question since you mentioned synchronous learning and asynchronous learning, uh, parents wants to know um, if you can please explain that. Yes, so we are going to be offering blended learning this fall and blended learning is a combination of in person learning and then remote learning which takes place at home. And so in both blended learning and then the alternative to that is completely remote learning where students are learning entirely at home through an electronic device in both of those um, those options, students will be learning at home through remote learning. And so when we talk about synchronous instruction versus asynchronous instruction, we're talking about what that remote learning experience is going to look like. And so for synchronous instruction, that's live instruction. So it's live engaging with a teacher, like we're engaging here uh, through some sort of video conferencing platform. So um, that is what parents can expect in the fall, and it, it should be very different than what many parents and students experienced in the spring. There will be live instruction for students who are in remote only or remote days 
um, whether they're in blended or they're remote only. So just sort of to clarify, um, for students who are learning through their remote on their remote days, whether it's Monday through Friday remote learning or it's through part of the week because they're in blended learning, they will have live instruction um, with their teacher. So live FaceTime with their teacher and their classmates. And we today released what that time breakdown is gonna look like. It's a sort of sliding scale, obviously for the young children, the, the three-year-olds, the four-year-olds, um, there's a shorter amount of screen time because you know, three-year-old, four-year-old, uh, it's not healthy for them to sit for a really extended period of time uh, in front of a computer screen. And also it's almost impossible to capture their attention for hours at length in front of uh, a computer screen. And so there's a sort of sliding um, scale of time that increases with the age of the student. And then there's also an increase over time from September to June. So as students start to become acculturated to uh, back into the school environment and they get used to sitting and getting back into instruction from September to November to January, you're gonna see an increase in the amount of uh, synchronous instruction. So live FaceTime with the teacher throughout the school year. Thank you. So. There is a, another question that um, follow up, but I'm going to come back to you. But I want to hear from our physician, um, Dr. Bindu, you know, who also have four children. And I know she and I have been discussing you know, some of the safety concerns, health um, safety when we send our children to school. So Dr. Bindu, what advice do you have? What parents should be you know, worried about, if anything? What I would say you know, it's a trying time for everybody, not only, um, you know, us as parents and adults and so many changes of family life, it's also a trying time for the children. And it's, it's scary, right? We hear COVID, we hear it on, they must be hearing it in the background with the news or, and some are very aware and watching the news. And it's important just to make it really simple and telling them this is, this is a new norm. It's not going to be the same as it used to be, but teach them and educate them as trying to keep social distancing the best way they can. Wash your hands constantly, don't touch your face, don't touch your eyes, try to keep the masks on at all times. It's really educating them and, and telling them to do the best they can. Because when you sit there and say, you must, you must, kids are going to be pretty scared. You know, it's, it's, it's hard. You talk about children who thrive on the freedom right of running and playing and, and associating with other kids and and now you're kind of putting all these enforcements but it's important to understand that this is for prevention and it's for our health and this is just for a time being till we can find an adult solution so explaining these things to the children sitting down and really telling them what this virus is and what it actually do and and making it a, a clarity between the child as opposed to maybe like not telling them you must do it or force it explain to them the need and the necessity and do the best they can and not to be scared and sit down and show them like we kind of take it for granted that maybe we need the kids know how to wash their hands or the kids need do the preparation as much as you can take your child to the sink show them exactly this is what you should do and how to put the hand sanitizers on and how temperature will be checked on them and to stay between the barriers and and to really listen and follow instructions of what the teachers may be saying and you can still continue your healthy life it's just there are changes that are going to take place and I think once you really sit down and have that one-on-one -on -one conversation like sit on a table explain to the child show them and show them yourself listen i'm the parent right like look mommy's doing it as well or if you have teenagers i have teenagers I, my age group of children is from 17 all the way down to seven so it's even if they're older sit down and even if they don't want to hear it and you're gonna be like mom i got this no let's sit down and do this because this is imperative not only for yourself and our family it's also imperative for others who may be having families who could be at risk so it's, it's really a lot of communication and education of hand hygiene, not touching the face and eyes, keeping the mask on. And when you do see your friends, try to do your best of social distancing. And um, you know, if there's anything that you feel uncomfortable or you don't feel well, or you feel sick, go straight to the nurse or straight to the teacher and speak to them and tell them whatever you feel. And that communication, don't be scared if you're feeling like your tummy's upset and or you're feeling like coughing not to go to the teacher, you know, try to make them very comfortable in the circumstances, despite the urgency of, of the situation. 
Thank you, Dr. Babu. Um, I also wanted to, uh, by the way, somebody asked me if this has been broadcast. Yes, it has been actually live broadcast on Facebook and also uh, it's been carried out on other news uh, media. Uh, I also see US News Online, they're also uh, telecasting these live. Um, so there are people, I already see that on my Facebook, there's hundreds of people are watching and questions are coming like crazy. We're gonna take it. A, you know, day and a half to go to all the questions, but we'll get to as many questions the parents have. There are some repeated questions. Um, you know, the reality is, you know, in New York, um, we lost 22,000 people. These are real life. And 79 of those are UFT member, teacher, staff. So, how is our teacher, our member of the, this whole mission that support from the, from the super, you know, from the, you know, basically security guard all the way to, to the, you know, lunch mom, you name it. Um, and of course the teacher. So we wanna hear from Mary, uh, obviously Mary Bakar, she's the representative of UFT. Um, she has the insight. How does their member feel? How does the teacher feel about this going back to this school? Are they feel safe? Are they feel do they have this confidence that they can do it? Mary? So uh, thank you, Dalip and Nava, for having us today. I see our teachers are on, um, and I see they're online too watching. So um, I appreciate you having this forum for them to hear different perspectives and, and what's going on out there. So thank you. Um, and I know my colleague Dave Walter's on, so he'll jump in anytime I miss something. Um, but we, our teachers, um, and just to remind everyone, we cover the paras, the teachers, the guidance counselors, OTs, PTs, school nurses, um, secretaries, I'm probably leaving someone out and someone will email me later that I left out a title, but um, the speech teachers, et cetera, they are all under our um, reign. We are very nervous. Um, they are very nervous. We're getting calls consistently. Many of our members are meeting, especially um, I'm most familiar with those in District 26 that are very anxious to go back. Um, people, especially those as crazy as it sounds, as those that did not have um, coronavirus during this time, because they're really terrified to bring it home to their family and home to their own children. And there's a real fear out there and we're trying to work with people so that they're not fearful. Clearly the best way um, for education to go is for us to be in our classrooms. And I will tell you very clearly, and we had conversations today with the Department of Education, Clearly, we would much rather be in our classrooms full time with all of your children in front of us. That's the best way for education to go at this time. And that's um, what we all want, you know, and I, I know some of you have heard me um, speak before. And one of the things that I feel strongly about, I would want my own children to be in front of their teacher and both of them, um, as the doctor was speaking, both of them are in college and um, you know, uh, 20 students in their school today were reported to have COVID. So we're expecting, um, I'm saying unfortunately for them to be coming home very shortly because we were just getting used to this empty nest over here. Um, so we're expecting uh, both of our boys to be home shortly and the schools to be closing. Um, but, and we don't want that to happen for the New York City Department of Education. We want um, a three pronged approach and I think everyone heard, and I hate being controversial when I come on these panels and excuse me to Deputy Chancellor Austin because she may not be smiling in a second, but we are willing to sacrifice and go on a strike if our um, three-pronged approach to um, going back into the buildings are not looked at very carefully. And we make sure that there's a comprehensive safety review, that there's a COVID response team, that the ventilation is checked. I mean, you've all seen our, our pieces. We thought that the school nurse piece was resolved. Clearly that has not been resolved. And, and today I know I heard from um, a teacher that works in district 26, but her children go somewhere into another district. And she was very concerned that there wasn't a school nurse in that, in that school. And we put her in contact with the right people in her district to just kind of ease her. It doesn't resolve the issue, but kind of ease her 
um, piece that we're working on that. Um, it was very upsetting yesterday to see Mark Traeger's post. And I will tell you, we had high hopes for the Department of Ed. And I, I do not say that in a, in a light way for ventilation. And I know there are differences, but when you see a yardstick and, and toilet paper on the end or tissue on the end, it doesn't give you this like great feeling that, yeah, we're, we're being heard. So um, we feel strongly that we wanna get back into those classrooms in as safe a manner as we can and make sure that we're in front of all of your children and educating them the best way that we know how. Um, one thing that I am proud of, and I think I, I wanna share this with all of you, is that District 26 has participated in more professional development this summer than ever before, partially because that was um, much of the professional development is often in the summer given in Manhattan. And so many of our teachers are Nassau County residents. And since it was available on Zoom, many of them attended more than ever before. We have lists and lists of teachers and paras and guidance counselors. Again, I won't go through every title that have attended tons of professional development. So our professional staff is ready to come back and teach your children. They're ready for remote learning if it's necessary. Hopefully it won't be a thing for too long if we have to go into that form, but we really believe that the department is not prepared at this time to have um, students back in the building. We're talking about a few weeks from now. We're talking about September 10th, which is really no time. Um, our teachers are working on um, looking at curriculum, which is not completed yet, but figuring out how to upload that. Where We at the UFT are giving a workshop on that for some people that are still really unsteady on their feet on that. But we just want it to be safe. And, and then to be a little selfish on another side, we, we don't want to have number 81. We don't want to have the next person in our ranks that we are suffering and listening to their um, to mm -hmm. their families cry on an executive board meeting when Michael has their families come on and we announce their name. And, and Dave from 158 and I are on the executive board representing this district. And on Monday nights, when we hear the name of one of our, our own, whether it was a retiree or in, in this case, um, in-service people, it breaks our heart to hear their names. And we just don't wanna hear that. We just wanna make their environment safe. So we've been encouraging families and those uh, many of you know, and you know, I know some of the teachers that are on this call tonight have children in the New York City Department of Education. We're asking to practice wearing your mask so that you get used to wearing your mask during the day if you have a little one. And I mean, that's something that we never thought we were gonna have to teach our children ever before, right? Um, but to wear their mask during the day so that they get that stamina. We wanted to get reading stamina. I never wanted to get mask stamina, right? But so that they're able to wear that during the day and, and practice washing their hands and counting and singing the alphabet or happy birthday as they wash their hands and everything our doctor talked about, about keeping safe protocols, keeping their hands away from their face. I will tell you that um, I'm one of the people that had COVID right at the beginning. And I, I now think about all the times I touch my face. And even today, as I was in a meeting, I moved the mask, I touched my face, I rubbed my eye and I'm counting and I kept like a little checklist. And it was like 44 times in the day that I was touching my face. And so we're trying to practice that ourselves and be an example for the children. And um, we're hoping that this all works out. We all get to be in front of your children and teaching them the way that we, we know and we love. Thank you, thank you. So uh, I also wanna give a shout out to Dr. Tara Davidson, our Deputy Chancellor at District 26. And also I see Anthony um, Inzerolo um, and also Kim D'Angelo. Uh, thank you for joining. Um, we are also joined by our Senator, uh, Senator Leroy Comrie, um, a good friend and you know, he always uh, reachable to the, you know, every community. So, Senator, what do we want to hear from you? Um, how confident are you that our school is safe for our children? That a mom can send their children on September 10 with a degree of confidence? I'm not. I, I'm not. I haven't made a. Uh final determination as of yet. I appreciate that the Department of Education and the mayor are trying to do everything they can to uh, get to a level of uh, confidence for our children and for our parents. Uh, but if today schools were going to start, I'd have to say that I'm very doubtful that the level of safety is, is um, going to be in place. Uh, you know, I'm also doubtful that 
they'll be ready by the 10th, but I'm giving them every opportunity to get it there. Uh, and especially in Queens, uh, we have a lot of older buildings, um, a lot of uh, properties that had asbestos in the walls. So, but the need to make sure that children are educated is critical. The need to make sure that they have a robust level of education uh, is critical. So um, I haven't made a final determination as of yet. Uh, we've been working with the Department of Ed to hold these town hall meetings and also to encourage, hopefully, the Department of Ed to take the suggestions that they're hearing from parents around the city. And I have to say that, um, you know, the Deputy Chancellor Austin has been uh, doing a great job at going around and talking and listening to people. I want to congratulate her in advance and, and her team. You know, it's a Herculean effort that it was dropped on them. Um, this is a this is something that no one, you know, six months ago uh, was ever thought we would have to take on. So, you know, the need to make sure that children are educated properly, children and children need socialization. They need interaction as part of their growth. You know, so it, it's a it's a conundrum. Um, it's a problem, uh, but I think that as opposed to pointing fingers, we need to just try to work on a solution-based type of situation, but being honest about what's going on out there so that folks can be informed. So I think that, you know, what we do um, in, in these forums is to try to get information out, uh, try to get our fears and concerns out, uh, try to get the, the Department of Education to think about every aspect, because it is, you know, I mean, you have children that are in all levels of, um, educational ability, all levels of physical ability. You have children that have asthma, you have children that tend to get the flu, you have teachers that are high risk just because they are who they are. It's a, it's a real difficult situation. It's not a cookie cutter, simple thing to get done. I truly believe that the Department of Education is trying to figure out the best methodology that makes sense. And, you know, we all have to try to work to give them the opportunity to do so, but also making sure that there are checks and balances so that people can make real decisions. We talk to people in education, um, they're, they're understandably fearful. Um, you talk to parents, they're understandably fearful, which you also have parents that, you know, that need to have their children educated in a separate environment from their home, you know, so it, it's a problem. So there's no um, immediate answer today there's just a desire to, from all parts to do everything we can to come up with a final solution that makes sense. But Senator, here is that another parent just uh, pinged me on, the, on my text. So if you feel that we are not ready, DOE and the school, the whole system is not ready, will you do anything to stop the school opening on the September 10th and make it fully remote? It's not my final, it's not my decision. You and your all colleague. All I can do is make recommendations. All the state Senate can do is make recommendations. Uh, it's not our final decision, but uh, we will be looking at everything and opining a joint decision um, or, or and encouraging the governor to make a wise decision as far as it pertains to schools. Uh, it is the governor and the mayor's independent decisions that they have, um, but again, we have to work together um, to try to come up with at least the, uh, the template to make a final decision from. You know, whether the school starts on September 10th, um, to me, is not the goal, but whether the school can start safely is the bigger goal. Um, you know, so we got to we gotta be safe. We got to keep Chancellor, Chancellor Austin around until she can be the chancellor for the whole system. You know, we got you know, keep Mary and, and even um even you around. So Joe, if you want you want your children, you don't want your children to come home and giving you COVID, you gotta run a hospital. So yep, you know, absolutely. we wanna we all wanna be safe. So, you know, it's a I think that if we focus on being positive about it and not pointing fingers, we can just and just pointing out the facts, you know, we'll all get to the right place at the end of this. Thank you, Senator. Um, so, um, Philip, I'm sorry, I got three more Zooms that are happening in the same time frame. So I'm going to zoom on down the road and you guys stay safe, talk with each other and, you know, fill me in on any new facts. Like Chance, Chancellor Austin, I've seen, I think, three times in the last three days or week. Um, she's, I just want to thank her again for, you know, being such a great um, 
representative for DOE and, and taking all the information. And it's good to see everyone else, uh, Dr. Bindu and, and all of the other folks that are on. I thought I saw, well, I see Tamara's picture, but I don't see her. So everyone stay safe and be honest and we'll get through this together. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Much appreciated your time for tonight. Um, well, have a good night, everybody. Stay thank safe. You. Thank you. So I wanted to um, go back to um, Deputy Senator Austin. There was a specific question for you. So what is specific measure are taking place to prevent transmission of virus among student and teacher? Yes, uh, a few things. And I, and I wanna start just by saying like, we are all in this together. We obviously want our schools to be safe places. Our schools need teachers. I, I've, you know, my dad was a teacher for over 30 years. Um, I have nothing but the utmost respect for the work that teachers do, their commitment to our kids, to changing the world one mind at a time. Um, and so, you know, we care about our teachers and our teachers' health. We care about our principals. And I want to acknowledge that everyone is working really hard, driving towards making sure that we have the best learning opportunities possible for students. Uh, in the fall as we start this new school year. And I think that that is what brings us to this place. And so I know there's a lot of perspectives of how we get there and we are working behind the scenes. And I know Mary you know, is working with DOE, um, other deputy chancellors and senior staff to get to a place where everyone feels confident and comfortable about what, how we start school and when we start school. Um, because we wanna make sure that everyone is safe, our students, our staff, everyone from you know across uh, our school communities. And so with that, how are we doing that? What is the plan? Um, I can tell you that at, at this moment, there are, uh, there are school ventilation action teams, um, but essentially they are professional engineers, custodial engineers that are third party contractors who are coming in, they're independent, they are surveying every single school in our system to look at our ventilation systems. They're looking at social distancing. They're looking at um, airflow across our school systems. They're creating a checklist and they're gonna provide that information for every school. Uh, if there are classrooms that don't have the ventilation or the air quality that are necessary in order to be safe, those classrooms will be offline. There will be no students and there'll be no staff in those places. If there's a school building that these professional engineers come in and they, they observe and they do their checklist and their walkthrough, if it's not safe, we won't use the school building. And so, you know, that's, that's part of how we're looking at that. Um, I can tell you in terms of our health and safety protocols, the state set a threshold of 5% um, for looking at the virus and the rate of infection and whether or not a school system could open or not. We are, at we, we are looking at 3%. So the current um, rate of infection across the city is under 1%. We, the mayor and chancellor set 3% as a threshold to determine whether or not schools in New York City will open. I can tell you that within schools, uh, the health and safety protocol is as follows. If there is a child or a staff member in a classroom who tests positive for COVID, then that entire classroom go, will go offline and quarantine for 14 days. Test and trace will come in and do an investigation and determine when and how and if that class should come back online. If there are two positive cases of COVID in a school within seven days, that entire school will be closed down and quarantined and test and trace will come in and do an investigation and then report to us when it's safe and what circumstances need to happen in order for that school to come back online. So we are taking really conser a conservative approach and thinking through how health and safety would work. Um, I can also tell you that we have purchased, you know, 4.4 million um, PPE. So every student, every staff member will have a mask. Um, we have purchased you know, over 100,000 uh, masks, uh, the face shields, um, and that's for our students who are not tolerant of masks. And we've heard that there are students, especially some of our students with disabilities who may be intolerant and have trouble wearing masks. We'll have face shields. Um, we will have a school nurse in every one of our school buildings. Our school nurses will have uh, N95 masks. Um, we are thinking through if a child is sick and this is, you know, whether it's symptomatic of COVID or anything else, students will automatically go to an isolation room. We'll have an isolation room in every school. Uh, that room will be specifically used if a student is not well, it will be um, manned by a staff member. And if anyone is unwell, not feeling well, um, we are messaging very clearly, please stay home. But also, um, you know, students will be sent home immediately and we'll have an isolation room to make sure that we are separating anyone who may be symptomatic. 
Um, I can also tell you that our custodial workers will be do, deep, doing deep cleanings of our school buildings every day. Uh, we have purchased electrostatic cleaners um, for all of our, our custodial staff. And this is to enable them to do a much more deep and efficient um, school cleaning that will disinfect all of these spaces within the school building that happens daily. So we're thinking through, and I and I really have to like give kudos to our staff because those are the folks who are getting our buildings ready. Our custodial workers are in our school buildings now. They are cleaning our school buildings. They are disinfecting spaces. They are putting the decals and the social distancing markers um, all over the schools. They are removing desks from classrooms to make sure that there's social distancing in every classroom. Um, I have to thank our principals who all of our principals have put together plans. You can go to our website. You can see individualized sort of plans. Uh, the level of detail vary depending on the school, but principals have done that. And they are doing the work of figuring out a lot of this, um, You know, going into their buildings, doing walkthroughs with their superintendents. I want to thank our superintendents. I think our superintendent is on the line, uh, Daniel Junto. Uh, thank you for being here. And also thank you for the incredible work that you're doing to lead this effort. Um, but it's really, it is a Herculean effort and it is our staff that's doing it. Um, it is our teachers, it is our principals, it is our social workers, it is the 150,000 human beings that make up the DOE that will make the difference in terms of how successful we are in the fall. Whether that's the work that's being hap that's happening remotely or the work that's happening in person. And so I'm thankful to the staff. I am proud to be a New York City DOE civil servant uh, serving the students and families in New York City. And I'm, I'm proud to to share this space with colleagues who are incredibly dutiful in serving our families and students and thinking about that. Thank you, uh, Chancellor, Deputy Chancellor Austin. You know, I'm gonna take advantage of the two of the superintendents that joined, um, Daniel Dimango from District 25, um, and also our very own Daniel Ginter from District 26. So, and you know, these two districts are very diverse and you know, a lot of our children attend these two districts. So, if I may ask um, Superintendent Jinta, uh, if you can just tell, tell our parents, uh, how ready is District 26 uh, for September 10 for blended and remote learning? Uh, good evening, everyone. And thank you, uh, Dr. Nath, for hosting this tonight. It's lovely to see you. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity to jump in. I'm feeling really um, excited and also there is a lot of work to be done in short order. Um, our schools have all selected and been approved for their models. Um, we have been meeting regularly with our district uh, facilities point, Mr. Lee Pasquale, who you know and has come to CEC meetings. Um, and he's been regularly visiting schools even before all the walkthroughs uh, started taking place. And now we're in the throes of our walkthroughs that are led by our borough partners, our UFT partners, and now the ventilation team that's going out. Um, our principals um, have notified every single family in the blended model of which days that uh, their children are coming to school. Um, that notification uh, went out in several modes, either email, regular mail, um, and other kinds of blasts that they use, um, different platforms that they use. So every parent participating in blended already knows what days they're coming to school. And now that we have the instructional guidance uh, with the parameters that were um, negotiated that, we, that came out yesterday, we've spent an extraordinary amount of time today unpacking that with our school leaders, making sense of it, um, going back to the drawing board. And so we're really in the throes of the more granular programming now um, we are having deliveries of PPE more and more every day. Um, we have um, to be proactive. Uh, Lee Pasquale um, sent as a PDF all the signage to uh, schools. So if they were ready to start some of this work before it was delivered, they had it at their fingertips. Um, and so the deliveries are on their way and coming in every day. Uh, our school leaders have been setting up classrooms for the last few months. Um, as they play with the way that they're using square footage and looking at their facility for um, social distancing purposes and where um, and identifying spaces where they might want to relocate an office or a smaller classroom if they needed to just to really ensure that that ventilation and that opportunity for that clean air and that extra comfort um, of safety is available for everyone. 
So I don't want to oversell it because the, the, you know, they always say the devil in the details and that's where we are now. That programming piece is complex. Um, it really, it's, it's so nuanced between how many are coming back, how many are in remote, how many teachers have an accommodation, how many teachers are coming in. Very complex. We're so grateful for the guidance that dropped last night um, and the ability to really process that together. Um, and so that's the space that we're in now. Um, so there's a tremendous amount of work to be done, um, but I want to give full credit to our school leaders. Um, every day they are pushing their vacations off so that they can keep at it. They are meeting with each other. They are meeting with their communities. Our uh, principals are doing multiple official town halls, informal coffee and conversations, chew and chats, tea and talks, whatever you want to call it. They're trying to put themselves out there. Um, our parent coordinators in partnership with Kim and Wendy always have been uh, extra available to parents. And I think we are all, I know today, uh, we started with DLT. We had the chancellor's call just before this call. We are, we are in partnership, living with each other. Um, somebody once uh, put on social media, we are not working at home. We are living at work. Uh, that one yeah. shook me, but it's very real right now. Um, so uh, to your question, uh, with all of those things, and I'm happy to keep talking, I, I am feeling really good. Uh, but I don't want to say it in a naive space. You know the complexities. We speak deeply about that every month at CEC and our other opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, so, th But that's the space that we're in right now. And thank you for the opportunity to share kind of what's been happening on the ground. So one quick question for you, um, Superintendent Jinta. So last night, um, Chancellor and Mayor sent out a new guideline. So is that guideline I mean, how different it is, or how is changing your plan that you have been planning over the summer? Sure. Uh, the guidelines are publicly available, um, correct, uh, DC Austin? I was, I, I, I believe that they are, and I know a parent letter is going to go out this week. I was okay. trying to find it, and I would have dropped it in the chat, but I can't find it online right now. So okay. if it's not there now, it should be this week because there's going to be a letter to families that explain the synchronous uh, learning. Great. And, and we can get that out. Um, I, I know things have been floating all over the place um, with information, but I think um, Dr. Nath, what is different about the guidance that came out, um, there are some labor negotiations in there that we were waiting for. Uh, where can we be flexible in class size? Uh, where can um, we have teachers doing some in-person and or blended? Uh, what, what, how are we pairing up the uh, teachers that are uh, co-teaching a cohort um, and so, like, for example, we always knew about that 30 minute collaborative planning space to start the day um, and really just kind of now understanding how that will come together deeper. But we also know one of our biggest topics over the spring was uh, the amount of live instruction for our children. And so the guidance that came out last night really delineates across, uh, um, you know, across the year, how many minutes of live instruction children will experience. Um, and it's developmentally appropriate, uh, meaning that we know that there are screen time recommendations for our younger, youngest learners uh, that start at 20 to 30 minutes and grow over time. Whereas our older learners will start, uh, you know, in a space of 100 minutes and grow over the year. Um, and that this time uh, can be chunked in various ways that meet the needs of the children. It could be like, I'm gonna, like in a regular class, a teacher, typically does a 10 minute launch of the lesson um, and then sends kids off to do independent practice. Um, and so she might pull a small group during that time where other kids are working and then rotate to another group and check in. So even in a regular classroom, regular day, it's not, we've worked very hard to make sure it's not the teacher talking the whole time that our kids are taking significant ownership over their learning. And this space that we're balancing synchronous and asynchronous instruction, um, we're going to fit into that paradigm of really continuing to front load content for our children and then promoting independence and ownership over their learning process. And that those minutes were delineated um, and some of the parameters that we really needed to know about staffing and class size, et cetera, that is what came out yesterday that's different than the July 31st document uh, that we looked at um, when that first dropped. Thank you. You know, I'm getting like message and I think the 
to, tonight, mom in Queens, they are not cooking dinner. I, I must tell you that because they're all watching you. Um, mm -hmm. Because they want, I mean, really, I mean, as I'm looking at this, some of these these questions that are coming up, it's really amazing that you know, still parents are confused. I mean, they are awfully con confused. In fact, I mean, some of the basic things. So before I get to some of these questions, um, I also want to take advantage of our superintendent from District 25, Daniel Domingo. Uh, but I also want to give a shout out to our assemblywoman, Alicia Heinemann, who joined. We will hear from her. Um, how about we want to hear from our superintendent from District 25 to see how ready you are, your district. Um, and you know, please tell our parents. OK. Good evening, everyone. And, and thank you for having me here tonight. So. Um, I echo uh, what Superintendent Junta had said, and, and um, for many of you that know the work that we do, we are very collaborative in um, supporting our districts together. So um, we in District 25 are really working in the same way. Um, I want to uh, once again celebrate all of our building leaders for the work that they have done and our teachers for really giving their time in this summer to collaborate with principals to make sure that we are ready to open. I also echo what Mary had said, and we are um, really happy and pleased at not just the amount of professional learning that was offered to our teachers um, throughout the city, but also teachers' willingness to participate in it. As we have said in the past, um, you know, and I don't like to use the term this new normal as part of education, but um, we are learning how teaching and learning in the virtual world um, can and should happen for our students. So um, both uh, Superintendent Junta and I have shared in that training and will continue to do so in working with our teachers to make sure that our students um, have the best education um, that they have, that they um, deserve both in our brick and mortar buildings and virtual. Um, we are also working very closely with our school custodians. I just did uh, four building walkthroughs last week um, and I'm happy to sit with them at the table and we are escalating any questions and concerns to our borough uh, facilities um, director as well as central and they have been extremely responsive to any questions and concerns that we have. Um, and we will continue to be available to answer any questions or concerns that parents have. I too am a parent. Um, I have a lot of questions and I, I always say to my parents um, in District 25, you help me ask the questions of my superintendent in Long Island. So um, we do understand your concerns and we also understand your expectations and we are working very hard to um, answer the call to that. But I do wanna say um, as Superintendent Junta has said that Central has been extremely supportive in um, answering our questions and getting what our schools need. Thank you. So before I uh, get to our assembly woman, I have a question for both of the superintendent. Um, the question coming from a parents. Uh, so some of the teachers are saying they have not received enough training uh, for remote learning. And how will you ensure that remote learning will be you know, as good as on-premise or um, in-person lear learning? So um, what I will say, and then I will turn it over to Superintendent Junta as well, is that we were, uh, we got right off the ground running when it came to working with our borough offices and our executive superintendent to make sure that there were um, high quality training for our teachers. Those were available starting in March and continue to be available now. So any teacher that feels that they don't have sufficient training or needs additional support should reach out to their school principal and we can get that for them um, up until when school starts um, and even following. So, so we're ready for that. Superintendent Junta? Yes, thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so as soon as we transition to remote, uh, you know I speak so highly of the Queens North Borough office and you've had a chance to meet so many of the great partners there. Uh, we, we went right into uh, different kinds across the districts in Queens North, professional learning plans. I um, mean, in District 26, I've spoken um, so highly of our focus on developing 
remote leads in every single building. And these teacher leaders, because we believe in uh, developing leaders at every level, um, engaged in intensive training, uh, both synchronous and asynchronous training, because we want our teachers to experience what we hope our kids will experience. Um, and then they became points in their school uh, to support their colleagues, to run professional learning, uh, someone to run to for support. Um, and that was more the pedagogical piece, not necessarily the technical how to get online piece, but what to do, how to really make robust lessons. Um, and we had, uh, a, you know, we, we jumped into that, I would say, as soon as we came out of that like crisis triage moment, uh, that was March, early April. So we had most of um, April, May and June where our remote leads were immersed in very structured professional learning uh, that we were able to track from their time out at the learning into the classroom where our borough instructional leads went into those remote leads classrooms and really saw how they were applying it and supported them in planning how to support their colleagues. Uh, when we transitioned to the summer, uh, there were different opportunities that teachers had um, autonomy in signing up for. The DOE offered um, things from, uh, topics from, uh, you know, uh, ramping up for summer school, uh, understanding a different platform from Google Classroom, which was the iLearn platform. Um, and then we launched summer school there, but then we had computer science. We had um, some focus on special populations. And what Mary shared is so true. The UFT um, really came out very strong with summer professional learning. Um, and the reason that I know so many of our district 26 and 25 teachers were participating is because when Mary has an idea, she runs with it and her people run with her and she ensures it's high quality. Um, and so she's been really excited to share with me some of that professional learning. Um, and as we're getting ready to pivot back to bringing everyone home um, on September 8th for our staff and 10th for our children, we have professional learning in mind that will become more structured again, that will be both citywide because we have a citywide vision, uh, but then district-wide because uh, we know what our individual districts need um, aligned to our district goals. Uh, in District 26, we'll continue to develop those remote leads. We know that we are going to have some teachers that can support with planning and virtual content. Um, and we really want to make sure that when we come out of this and we come back together fully home in uh, whatever the new version of our regular old world will be, um, that we remain on track for where we were as a district uh, prior to uh, leaving. Yep, and, and uh, Dr. Nath, one of uh, the, the things mentioned before in the instructional guidance that came out in the, uh, from the city that is very strong and, and parts of conversations that we're having in District 25 and in Queens North in general is around um, the, the, the way we look at curriculum and accessibility of curriculum to all teachers. So with the teaming that's about to happen between our brick and mortar and our virtual teachers, it's around how do we get together and speak about this common curriculum, which is also aligned to the next generation learning standard. So there's really professional learning put in place that's going to be very powerful in ensuring that teachers have access to each other and to a common curriculum that is standards aligned. Additionally, um, we are also looking at something that is very exciting that we had discussed the other day, which is um, what does accessibility to curriculum look like for parents? And I, I surfaced this myself once again as a parent. When my child was struggling virtually, I did not even understand where they were um, in terms of curriculum. So that is something that throughout this pandemic, um, we recognize is a very important piece in order for families to both be engaged in a deeper way with us and um, as well as being able to support their children at home. So that is happening simultaneously. We're very excited about that work as well. Thank you. I know we are almost at the hour and we will hear from our assemblywoman, but our, um, our chancellor, our deputy chancellor, she has to attend another event. So uh, before um, Chancellor Austin, you leave, we have a question for you. Um, and then also anyone else also want to jump on, you can. The question is, what would you advise parents to consider when making a decision in sending their children, um, child back to school? Uh, just best interest of the child. I mean, I'm a parent, I have a seven-year-old and a 10-year-old, and mm -hmm. I think 
you know, parents will make this decision as we make all decisions. What is in the best interest of your child? And for every family, that's going to look different. Um, and I expect, you know, to be able to be here in front of you. And I'm thankful to our superintendents who are here as well to give you as much information as we can about your options, both blended learning, both remote only learning to give you confidence so that parents know no matter what you choose, we have really strong educational learning opportunities for students. So with that, I really thank you for inviting me to be here tonight. Thank you to my colleagues who are here with me, uh, sharing information with our families and communities. And thank you to our parents who are here engaged, uh, wanting to know more and in that important uh, position of, of being able to make an important choice for their children. So thanks, thanks all, good night. Thank you, um, Deputy Chancellor Austin. Um, this is very, very important for our community. You know, as we always say, Quincy is the most diverse borough. You know, we speak 200 different languages here uh, from 180 different country. And, you know, 50% of the people that live in Queens that born outside of America. So, you know, as you can imagine, when you have a 1.1 million children a strong school system, um, and when you're changing things, you know, you know, every day it, it becomes confusing and confusion and also challenging. And, you know, we, on behalf of NAWA, we thank you for the work that you do and educating our parents, educating our community, educating our mom. Um, and this is really uh, very helpful. Uh, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, so, everyone. Good night. Um, is there anybody else wanted to, any of our panelists wanted to jump on this question? Um, let me repeat the question again. So what would you advise? the parent to consider when making a decision, meaning blended or in-person learning, when they send their children to the school? Anyone, anyone wants to comment on? My advice would be being a mom, again, um, college age students, but do what's best for your family. Um, you know, whatever you feel most comfortable with. And, and I, I know that firsthand, we are not comfortable at all with sending our kids to college, but you know, uh, they're adult men. And so we had to send them off, um, you know, so you have to do what's comfortable. That's not gonna keep you up at night and making sure that you're getting the best for your family. And, you know, I encourage you um, and you'll hear this from, um, my colleague Dave and myself during that 2 to 2.20 time, that office hour time, we're encouraging you to contact your teachers and talk to them, whether you're remote, blended or not, whenever it is we go back, whether it's the 10th, the 21st, November, I'm kidding, no, you know, whenever it is that we go back, we are encouraging you to call us and ask us questions. And um, just as um, Superintendent Jenter and, and Superintendent Domingo said, uh, the union will be pushing for all of that curriculum to be uploaded to your learning management platform prior to the start of school, prior to you all starting. And we will push that and push that and push that. And Mulgrew has, has pushed it and he will continue to push that so that you'll have all of those answers in front of you. Thank you. So, um, yeah, I, anyone? I also, I also uh, say, say one thing that's very important. Um, you know, as a mom who thought she knew her children so well during this time, um, I got to know them even better just as learners. And I think as parents, um, we had some children in the district that thrived in a virtual world and some that really needed to come to school. So if parents feel that it is safe for their children to come to school, um, and they need to do that as my children needed to do that. Um, so my son will be going to school and my daughter, I'm, I'm still making the decision about, but you know your children best and you saw them in, in a, a variety of different learning environments now. So I think that's very important that you take that into consideration also when making your decisions. Thank you. I know we are a few minutes over nine, uh, but we will, if we, if you can, if you can stay for a few more minutes. So I wanted to f finish a few more questions. But at this time, we want to hear from our Assemblywoman, Alicia Heinemann. Before she became an Assemblywoman, she actually used to be the chair of the CEC um, and District 25. And she education is something very close to her chest. Um, and she deeply cared about that. So Alicia, um, the Assemblywoman, Alicia Heinemann. Thanks, Dilip. Adriana, I'm following you. <laughs> we had another meeting together. <laughs> Good to see a lot of familiar faces and thank you, Dilla. I'm not gonna take a lot of your time. The first thing is thank you to the teachers that are here. I can't tell you how when March hit, how becoming a parent slash teacher was a challenge because 
you know, if it was up to me, she'd have recess all day because it just wasn't, it wasn't a good combination. Um, and now I, as a parent, I've opted for a full remote. I just don't feel comfortable. And I think what Mary said is, is paramount. How comfortable do you feel? And I'm glad that um, the DOE higher ups were on. And I think ultimately, if you have the ability to keep your child home, um, if you can do that, then great. If not, then you really have to work with the program the DOE has. Or call your elected officials because we are trying to supplement some child care resources. I know we're trying to do that in District 29. Um, and then on another note, I have a 22, a 21 year old who this is her last year of college. They just announced that they were doing a hundred percent remote because the neighboring school, would, she goes to school in Baltimore, Maryland, Townsend U University, they had an outbreak. So their school said it's a hundred percent remote. Guess what? She's home with me this fall. I got used to her being out of the house <laughs> three years and this last year she's back, but I would rather her be here and healthy than on campus and the outbreak happen. So to everyone, you have to do what's best for your family. I commend the teachers because they dealt with um, situations unheard of, trying to do remote learning, working with kids who are going through trauma, work, going through trauma themselves, losing their colleagues, um, to our principals who work tirelessly and are still working, probably most of them have not taken any time off trying to find the best plans to make sure that their children and staff are safe and that they have enough custodial staff and supplies to keep the buildings clean. It's a challenge all around. I will tell you that I have pushed act several times for the mayor to push the date back. Um, doesn't look like it's happening. So this is, is very, I see you have a lot of health professionals on here too, to deal with children who have anxiety because if the parents have anxiety, imagine the children, they must have anxiety too about going back and you know, when we were kids, no matter what language kids would play the, you know, you got the cooties game and running after each other with saliva or whatever, or coughing on each other, I can imagine what's going to happen now, even the small spaces and kids will be kids. And I know they need the socialization. My daughter misses her friends. We had a play date in a park the other day. They were very happy to see each other. So to all of you, please know um, your elected officials are here to support you. We're here. Um, you're, you have some really great CEC members. I came out of CEC for nine years in District 29. The volunteer, the volunteering that they do is commendable. The knowledge that they have is, is, um, is work to be treasured, but it takes all of us. And you've heard this over and over again, I know, um, but we're in this together. We're parents, we're someone's child. We are some of us are grandparents. It takes all of us to make this work, no matter what language you speak, you know, what religion you practice. Queens is the, the diversity that a lot of places envy. And we get through this together. The teachers, the parents, the administrators, the DOE, all of us need each other to get through this. And I'm going to need a lot of people because remote learning is, is two weeks and somehow we have to do this all over again. God bless us all. So thank you, Dilla. Thank you, um, Assemblyman uh, Alicia Hyman. So I wanted to, I mean, I'm gonna combine a couple of the questions. So as our panelists make your final um, remark, if you can please answer some of this question. Um, and I'm just gonna read through it. One of the questions is a couple of parents asked, um, are the school ventilation system use filter that are rated MER 13 or higher? And also, um, one of the parents wants to know school, I think is providing only the cold lunch. I don't know if it's true or not, but if you can please comment on that. Um, and also how you are really um, maintaining the social distance. If you can please touch on that based on um, your, um, your preparation in each of the school. And finally, uh, your final thought, if you can please, please tell our parents why they should or should not send their children to learn in person or they should choose um, remote. So I'm gonna go in the order that I had before. Um, we hear from, how about Kathy? Kathy, you, you've been quiet for a long time, Kathy. So give your final um, remarks. And also if you can touch on any of these questions that came in. And also I apologize to all the parents uh, because there are so many questions. And again, it will going to take me a day and a half to get through all of them. But I think 
we cover most of the important ones that are keep coming. So, Kathy? Thank you, Dilip. Thank you. I'll take the last question um, that you posed in terms of sending children back. As I said, I have four children. Um, I have a, a senior in high school, in high school um, a, a sophomore in high school, and an eighth, an eighth grader, and an incoming uh, sixth grader for middle school. So they're all in different stages. And um, so uh, I think um, uh, uh, Superintendent Domingo mentioned that every child is different. All my children are different and they have different needs. So uh, we're taking it one at a time. Uh, my children go to school all over um, the city in three different boroughs. So that's another consideration in terms of sending your child if they have to travel to their school. Many of our children from Queens do travel to other boroughs to go to school, especially high schools. Um, so, you know, all these considerations have to be taken into account. Um, at this point, um, on a you know, a, a, for a parent leader, that's what I'm saying. Uh, for a parent at this moment, I do not feel safe sending my children back, um, and it's a you know, it's a very scary proposition right now. So, um, as uh, Superintendent uh, Janta eloquently um, said, uh, we're all working together. Uh, we're all you know, again, as we're all on this call, it's a testament to that. Um, but there's. Um, I just find that there's more um, unanswered questions at this moment than answered questions. Um, but I want to, um, before I go, just again, thank you for this opportunity and thank you everyone on the call. Thank you, Mary, and all the wonderful teachers who are on this call. Um, as I always say to you, I could, as a parent, I could cry from our beautiful teachers um, around the city, especially in District 26. Um, you know, I, it, it's a pleasure to work with all of them and with all our principals. So again, thank you all. Thank you. Um, Adriana Aviles, um, president of the CEC 26, what is your thought and what are you doing for your children? I'll of course answer the last question as well. <laughs> so um, I'm more of a um, person that's very positive and I try to look in the best in every kind of situation we're in. And I'm very blessed and grateful that I do not have any kind of situation at home where someone is, um, has the immunity, I have to worry about them being sick or anyone has any kind of condition in my household. So I have complete faith. When I send my kids back, we've been practicing with the masks, we've been practicing with the hand washing, we've been practicing, we've been reading every other day, we've been doing a lot of things here at home. I feel as a parent, that's our job. I don't want the teachers teaching them that. They, I have to teach them to be safe. So I'm teaching them. So when they go back to school, they miss their friends. They miss the socialization. They miss their teachers. They miss everything about school. So I know it was a terrible, terrible what happened in March. They were not, it was just, I don't even want to touch on that. But I'm hoping, and I'm, I'm very religious, and God willing, that everything will be all right for my children in September. That's my choice. It's for them to send them back and hopefully everything will be, I love my uh, administrations and my schools. I have complete faith in the teachers as well. That's my situation. So I will be sending my children back. And I have a little one, I have a third, one in third grade. I have one that's starting in sixth grade, another one that's going to eighth grade. So at home, I feel that we're pretty secure in sending them back. I know not everyone has that choice, but that's mine. Thank you. You know, um, me and my wife have the disagreement on this um, she's very much nervous, but I, you know, I've been telling her that you know, school uh, and leadership are working very hard to keep the school safe. So I'm sending my um, the younger one who's going to the sixth grade at Ryan. He's going to take class in person. My elder one who came, you know, who's just going to the college, he's also actually, we dropped him last week at the dorm. So he's also attending class in person. Um, again, you know, God willing, hopefully everything will be um, safe and fine. So, Mary Beccaro, uh, our UFT rep. Uh, Mary, what is your thought? Well, I heard about the, the families, so I'll tell you now as a wife of a teacher, he will be going back. <laughs> um, <laughs> Vinny will be in person, but I will tell you, we've already had this discussion. Um, so if you live in Belrose, you might see Vinny uh, getting undressed in front of our house because we no shoes and no clothes that were in school will be allowed into this house without getting washed. So there'll be some excitement on our porch every day when he comes home from work. Um, you know, I, I will tell you that one of the things that makes me so proud to be a teacher and so proud to be a wife of a teacher is how um, we think of our 
your children as our children. And I, uh, some families have called us um, since remote learning now, families have cell phone numbers of, of teachers and et cetera. And some families of um, my husband have called and spoken to him. And obviously as a DOE employee, he's not giving his opinion. He's saying you need to do what's, what's right for your family. But I will tell you when he hears about, especially the children that are coming from the Rockaways that go to Van Buren and are taking the A train to the F train to the bus, um, he's worried about them. He's, he's been talking to them about making sure they wear a mask, you know, um, again, high school kids. So he tells them, make sure you're not kissing on that bus. Make sure you're just uh, ride the bus and, and get to school, you know, and, and do your thing. And to make sure they're not drinking out of each other's water bottles as they, you know, are, they drink often out of, and talking to them. So I know in our own home, we're not only worried about our two children, but we're worried about the 300 children. Well, I'm worried about all of your children in our district, but he's worried about the 300 children that he'll serve as their teacher this year and um, really concerned that they'll be safe. Just because you said about the filters, and I'm sure Anthony knows this much better than I do, but the filters are only where there's an HVAC system. So that's not going to be the best ventilation. And we were with, um, if, if Deputy Chancellor was here today, we were with some of the best occupational hygienists in the country. And they were really talking us, uh, to us about, and I'm, I'm sure the doctors here all know this better than I as well, about really keeping those windows open and making sure those windows are open and, and um, making sure there's ventilation in a proper way. So if we can make sure of that, send your child with a sweater or a tank top, depending on the weather, you know, in an appropriate way so that they can be dressed for that proper ventilation if they're coming to the classroom. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so actually, you know, my, our president at our health science center where I work, our president made it very loud and clear the other day in his town hall. He says, you know, when you come to the office in the morning, open the window for half an hour because, you know, when you have air ventilation, uh, this virus doesn't do very well. Uh, it doesn't survive. So um, I'm sure, you know, if we can practice this protocol, um, I think this will be helpful. So want to hear from our doctor, um, you know, some of the basic, uh, what parents should do, you know, in terms of uh, keeping their children safe, you know, after they come back from the school, do they need to wash their school bag and, you know, wipe their book, books and pencils and all the other stuff. So Dr. Bindi, if you can please uh, give us your final um, thought on that. Yeah, it's very hard because WHO first was saying that, you know, a um, certain amount of timing was there where, you know, it was infectious. Now they're saying vice versa. Um, my, my call would be do the best you can when you bring home is yes, take, or I, I would suggest to definitely, you know, remove their clothes and make them go, you know, wash up and wash their face. And because these are children, it's not like adults where, you know, they're, they're going to be out there. They're going to touch things. They're kids. Um, but make it in a happy practice, you know, a positive practice as opposed to like a something a nerve wracking practice, practice, you know, make it into a routine. You know, it's kind of like when we sing happy birthday as we wash our hands, do it a routine, like take off your arm, take off your leg. When it's for smaller kids and make a routine, that's the best way so that they don't get nervous and apprehensive. Yes, I would say take off, you know, make sure you wiping down their backpacks and because of CD, I mean, CDC and WHO regulations, it's not a pure necessity. Um, but I would always say, you know, keep it in one corner of the plate home, make sure, you know, you wash your hands, keep, keep doing things till we get more, much more concrete information that's going on about the spread of the virus. It constantly changes, but we do know that it does spread. So wash your hands, do not go neurotic, wash your hands, change the clothes, you know, um, and make sure they wash their face, come home and can constantly teach them and make them aware to practice um, safe hygiene and washing hands and face, you know, constantly. That's the best way you can do um, for the children and, and teaching them. And I, I don't know if the schools are doing hot lunches, but from what I understand, they were doing cold lunches. So, you know, that's sitting in their feet and six feet and making sure they're not sharing their foods. That's really important. Make sure you explain, explain to your children not to share your food, not to take other people, other kids, you know, you know, we used to swap snacks and things like that it has to be limited. And I think um, 
what Adriana said very clearly is true. As parents, we have to safeguard our children. That's our responsibility to teach our kids. It's not the teacher's responsibility. Of course, teachers care, and they will do the best they can. But as a parent, we have to teach them this new routine. Um, and that's really what it is. And I do agree. It's, it's, uh, right now, at this time, it's, it's parents have to really choose what's best interest in their family. Um, you know, there, if there's a possibility if people are blessed to keep their kids at home and work from home and, and uh, weigh it out a little bit, then if that what suits your family, that's good. If you can't, people have to go to work and, and you know, you want a system going on and this is what you have to do, then yes. It looks like, to me, um, the school system is doing the best that they can in implementing safety. But I am kind of high strung about the ventilation. That is very important. Um, you need to have proper ventilation. Uh, I, I do believe the city needs to get on that. So yes, you can open the windows, but there must be a better filtration system that needs to take place. That's, that's a no brainer. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bindu. Thank you to all of our panelists. Um, actually, Anthony Inzolo or Dr. Tara Davidson or anyone uh, wants to touch on the social distance and ventilation because that we have so many parents ask on that. Um, can any one of you, Anthony, go ahead. I think one hey, or two. Good evening, everyone. I, first of all, I want to tell you, I have three children and uh, one of my oldest is, he's out of college already, but my two daughters that are in high school, they will be attending school in September. I feel very confident that uh, they'll be okay. And like many other families, I'm very fortunate with no one in my home has uh, extraordinary circumstances or medical conditions that uh, you know we have to be really concerned about. So we're really, we're really thankful for that. So right now they are going to school, although I will say my wife is probably a little more apprehensive than I am about that. Uh, but I also say that in light of, of, of supervising and also attending the rec sites on a daily basis since they opened up in March. And since we've opened up, uh, we've had zero students that have uh, uh, tested positive for COVID. We've had one staff member since we opened up tested that had, that has tested positive for COVID. So our results have uh, been really, really good. Uh, so we're, um, I say that, you know, I'm excited about that and I'm, and I'm sure that schools will follow the very similar protocols that we're following at the rec sites in order to keep our children and all of our staff safe because the staff, they all have children and, and families when they go home and children, we wanna make sure that they go home and that they're safe as well. Um, regarding the ventilation systems, there's lots of different walkthroughs. There's lots of different professionals that are going in and out of the schools uh, up until next week to ensure that uh, school buildings are safe uh, to open up. Uh, there have been, uh, there are walkthroughs that are occurring now by professional engineers to make sure that that airflow is appropriate and that that airflow is safe uh, for everyone inside of the school. The chancellor has, uh, and the New York City Department of Ed have committed to saying that if there is a school where the ventilation is not adequate, then they won't open. If there are particular classrooms with windows that don't open, poor ventilation, those classrooms will not be used. I had the pleasure of visiting a school today uh, and that school is, is ready to go and ready to open. So um, I'm hoping that we have, we're ready and we're ready to welcome all of the children back on September 10th. Okay, so it's 9.24, we're gonna try to finish it by 9.30. Um, we wanted to also hear from Dr. Tara Davidson, but there is a two questions and a parent, this parent is gonna kill me if I don't um, ask you this. One of them, they wanted to know this blended learning, right? You know, you have a group A, group B, group C. And why this model was chosen where, you know, why is that consistent? Because some of the parents, they work and it's become very difficult for them, you know, this, you know, variable casual for them. And the other thing is they wanted to know if they choose to keep their children at home, choose remote learning, how will they make sure they're getting the best education as compared to in-person? So if you can briefly touch up on this again, because many parents again and again asking for this. 
Sure. Thank you, Dr. Neff, for this opportunity and putting together this space for our families to ask questions tonight. Um, and I think in terms of the first question and choosing our models, our school communities collaborated with um, their school reopening committees to do walkthroughs of their building and to evaluate every classroom and instructional space in the building um, and look for the square footage to accommodate um, everyone safely, right? So that's our primary goal is to make sure that there's enough safe square footage in every classroom to have that adequate ventilation that Anthony was just talking about. Um, and so that instruction continue in person. And that's something that we've seen at the rec sites since March successfully and something that we're gonna maintain in the new year. And so I think in terms of the model, the Chancellor's three models that were presented were based on that square footage accommodation. And so our schools had to really consider individual classrooms. Um, the number of parents and students who chose remote only versus that blended in-person model. And based on those numbers, they work to accommodate as many families and students safely in person as possible. And so that's how those models were determined. And our, our school leaders continue to work on a daily basis to make sure that those are updated and um, maximized to the most uh, extent for families. And then as we think about moving towards uh, blended instruction versus in-person, again, I think we've talked a lot about each family making that, that individual decision that's right for them in terms of which approach to choose. But the reality is in either scenario, we are, we are guaranteeing that your child will have live instruction every day. They will have the same opportunity to work towards those priority standards um, and that's that instructional curriculum that we know and have come to expect in District 26 in Queens North and in New York City, where we're prioritizing the experiences that we know and value for our children. And that's something that in, in either scenario you will have, you will make sure that your child will have that face time with teachers, um, that they will have that synchronous and asynchronous experience. They will be receiving feedback on all of their work um, and we'll making sure that they're prepared to meet the, ne the next level and whatever it is that they wanna do. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Davidson. Is anyone wants to make a, any addition, any more final thought, any of the superintendent, uh, Kim, anyone, please, we have few more, three more minutes. I have a lot of questions, but I don't want to get into the question. But if you want, if you have any last minute thought that you want to share. Well, if there is nothing else, um, I really wanted to thank all of our panelists, uh, all the superintendent um, and deputy superintendent and everyone else that um, helping us uh, to share this important uh, information to our community and having this dialogue and communication is really helpful. And again, I thank you all very much and looking forward to the successful school year and everyone have a good night and stay safe. Thank you all. Thank you, Dilip. Thank you for having us, Dr. Neff. Thank, thank you, Dr. Neff. Good night, everybody. Good night.